Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, I don't know, should we start? I don't know if Jerome and Jacopo... I think we can start. Jerome should be connected. So... I, I'm here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, ah, okay, good morning. So let us start. Well, yeah, there are not so many participants yet. But... Yeah. Well, maybe... Uh, what, what does Andrea say? He's not here, Andrea, I'm today. Here. No, Andrea has some meetings this morning and he will skip. Okay, well, as you as you wish. Maybe wait two minutes. Uh, but Let's wait another, another one minute at 10. Okay, okay no problem. Minutes, and then we start. Ora ti chiudo, eh. Okay, Filippo, I think you can start now. Okay, just one second. Okay, so uh, just to recap, uh, what we have seen is that the synthetic model has an interesting image shape and that so much, not so much is known about all this. The only thing about which we have some control is the Arctic curve, actually in a, with some generality. I mean, uh, just uh, even going beyond the square let is uh, the equivalent of, of the Aztec diamond. So uh, today we shall illustrate a method uh, to obtain Arctic curve. I have, I have drawn the six different uh, vector configuration just to have them in mind and, and the slides. And uh, so the first thing is to introduce some object. Uh, so just to explain a, a code, I will, uh, when I draw some lines, this it means they are heavy lines. And uh, for instance, here I have uh, heavy lines then I will not draw all the thin lines, okay? I will just draw these lines just to fix what is the lattice. And uh, here we have one N. Uh, we have N vertical line, actually, N horizontal line of the lattice on which we have N path, path which start from the top and uh, get out of the lattice from the left. This is the domain wall boundary condition and uh, when I depict something like this, I am saying uh, here, everything is fixed to be thick on the left end and on the top edge, while on the right and bottom edge, everything is fixed to be thin uh, or uh, to have no path. And in the middle, you, can, you have to sum over all configuration. So this is a partition function, okay? This is just because I will use this kind of convention in, in drawings. Okay. so. Since we have here n lines, n horizontal lines, and n vertical line, we have all these paths from the top, which will get out from the left. In particular, one of these paths, this one, will make its wandering all around the lattice according to the configuration one is considering. But at some step, at some sooner or later, it will, it will arrive in the last horizontal line. And uh, you, it's easy to see that between the first and the second lines, there will be only one thick edge, 
which will be at some position r. So you can compute, you can imagine to compute, you can define the probability of having this configuration where this is fixed to be at position r. So how to compute this? Compute this particular partition function where you have fi fixed this thick edge at position r, you divide by the original uh, partition function, and this is exactly the probability. Or if you want, it is uh, a one point boundary correlation function. And it is denoted in this way. Sorry for this problem. It is denoted in this way. So it is, uh, this is a boundary correlation function on an n by n lattice with domain wall boundary condition. That is a probability of serving at position R, this thick edge. Okay, so this is a, an obvious and direct consequence of the line conservation, which is uh, essentially the definition of the sigfred text model. One can think about what happens to this probability when you, you consider the limit n going to infinity. So it is convenient to define a kind of uh, free energy. So this is a, the rescaled variab variable. Instead of R, I rescale R, writing it as some X continuous variable where uh, X belong to the unit interval, real interval. <coughs> so what is this? This is a, the free energy, <coughs> the free energy which is not uh, tell you uh, well, uh, tell you it is a free energy of, of uh, the configuration with uh, uh, this vertex at position R, or if you want, when you are in the scaling limit at position X, where X it is some point between zero and one. It is clear, it is clear that this function SN of X, it is clear and it can be proven rigorously that this function SN of X is uh, convex or concave and uh, it has a minimum and the minimum is in correspondence of from of some x0 and uh, x0 is a rescaled value according to this rule of the of the position of this vertex and in the scaling limit it is thus i would like to to emphasize that this is a contact point between the arctic curve and uh, the edge of the vertex. I recall you that here we have all this configuration of vertex A of the first type. Here we have all vertical B lines, here all horizontal B lines, here nothing, no lines here. And here the position of contact is clearly related to the fact that the last horizontal line in the bottom at some time start to, to move in this way to go this way, okay? So the position in the scaling limit, this X zero is just what is called the contact point of the Arctic curve with the bottom edge. So we can, uh, since we have defined the SN of X, uh, it is uh, convenient to go to some kind of Legend transform. So we introduce some generate function. This is a little bit boring, but uh, it is uh, what will play the role, uh, main role in the game which is coming. So we can define just a generating function for the one point boundary correlation function in a very standard way. This is defined in this way. So here there is no scaling limit yet. Okay, the generating function, if you think of Z, for instance, uh, as a, well, yeah. it is what is called sometimes Z transform or whatever. And uh, so you can associate the, uh, in this uh, Legend dual description, the 
the Legend dual of Sn of x is a quantity R of z, which is built in terms of Hn of z as follow. It is a scaling limit of the quantity So, modulo the Legendre transform which, which relates the, the variable z with the variable r, this function r of z is essentially the function which describes the probability of finding r somewhere. Of course, this probability is uh, peaked in correspondence of the contact point, then it has some fluctuation. The fluctuations are subleading, uh, actually are sublinear, so in the scaling limit, this fluctuation become more narrow and narrow, but uh, this fluctuation will be important in what will come soon, okay? It is clear that when you go in the scaling limit, the function f hn of z, which we have defined as there, in, in the limit n to infinity, can be replaced by some Riemann sum you, you, you replace the index R with some variable Xi N, where Xi is a continuous variable which varies between zero and one. If you prefer, you, if you like, you can think of divide, multiplying and dividing by N, the one over N will become the D Xi in the Riemann sum. And then of course we will have Okay, there is a minus one, but we are in the large n limit, so we can ignore it. So we can even rewrite this in this way. Z to Z R equal exponential of R log Z, okay? <laughs> then with this, with this uh, scaling limit performed in this way and recognize this, this, this Riemann sum, the variable RZ that we have defined over there you can, uh, um, we know that this is a convex function, so you, you, we can uh, try to do this by saddle point expansion. And if you do it, uh, uh, you can do it cleanly. Actually, what you see is that, of course, L of Z is defined in this way. So you have to, to make the limit of one over N. The derivative, you can re rewrite this as a derivative with respect to log z. For some reason, maybe Jacopo, you can act on the volume. There is some, some echo sometime. Maybe you should just decrease slightly the volume. Okay, I'll try. So, yes, you, Rz is by definition this. I have just rewritten this, re replacing z, dz with a derivative with respect to log z, and thus uh, it is clearly, we replace now this expression for hn, and what we get is xi xi. When we make the derivative with respect to log z, we drop this psi n, the so n is cancelled by this one, and we are left with Okay, so what is this? It is clear in the saddle point approximation, this is just the value of the saddle point. By definition, modulo, because this is normalized, you know, since you have a, sorry, I have, uh, is it correct? Yes. Where the saddle point, these values, xi saddle points come from evaluated this in the saddle point approximation. So here you replace xi saddle point and always define this xi saddle point just by solving the saddle point equation associated to this exponent. And the saddle point equation is simply 
um, you derive this term will give you log z plus the limit one over n the index i a h n of x i n. So, uh, well, it's just a, a little bit a long story to say that there is a fundamental quantity which is which will appear continuously in the next hour, and which is this R of Z, which is the dual transform of some of some S N of X essentially, and S N of X is a free energy associated uh, to the position of this R. Not that the free energy is of order n and non n squared, because we are considering always this R moving on this line, and we have subtracted the bulk contribution coming from the partition function. Okay, so we need to keep for the future essentially this formula. Uh, here I think I have made a sorry here there was of course a mistake uh, here there is a logarithm which is missing so when you derive that's why you obtain this etc you obtain the ratio and so uh, well it is standard other point calculation uh, A, where HN of Z is just a Fourier transform, kind of Fourier transform generating function. And uh, when you go into scaling limit, this function evaluate to some uh, value C saddle point, which depend of course of Z and which is defined by this saddle point equation, by the solution of this saddle point equation. Okay. So, another ingredient uh, well, uh, now I will make a kind of uh, trivial calculation, a little bit trivial calculation about the single uh, random walk or directed path, if you like. So, if you have already seen this, it is trivial. But if you have never seen this, I mean, uh, it requires a little bit of, of, uh, of thinking. So let us suppose, you now forget about the lattice, uh, the six vertex model. You have just a lattice and you have a directed lattice path from the origin to some point of coordinate, let us say, And the directed lattice path is a path on this lattice. Which can only make north, sorry, east and north steps. Of course, there are many of them, how many are there? It is easy to see that they are just If you, this is trivial exercise to see this. And uh, <clears throat> of course, there are many of them. There is, for instance, one which just goes straight horizontally and then straight vertically, an, an extremal one. Another extremal one is this one. But then you have many of them. And if you go to the scaling limit, it is well known that <clears throat> 
uh, that is if you send L and M to infinity with a fixed ratio and uh, you look at what comes out, you will see that your path become closer and closer to a straight line. Because the, fluctu uh, the fluctuation are sublinear in N, actually they are uh, of order square root of N, so in the large N limit, you don't see any more the fluctuation. So even this extremal path here, will uh, have uh, zero weight among uh, the, with respect to the most majority of paths which accumulate, concentrate along this straight line. This is, if you like, an example of limit shape, actually. It's exactly what happens with the domino tiling where you can uh, compare this, this pathway with uh, uh, your domino, which has only horizontal dom, uh, your tiling with only horizontal dominoes, and you can compare this path to the one with a lot of vertical dominoes, and of course there is a full, a full intermediate situation, and in particular you see that in the scaling limit, this intermediate situation concentrate all on what is, what give rise to the Arctic Circle theorem. And here it's very similar. <coughs> so, what we want to do now is just actually to prove this. So what we shall do, we shall write, we shall draw here some line at height, K, and it is clear that we can. So what we have, we have that the partition function, that is the number of lattice paths, is simply given by this binomial. But you can think to divide, to, to partition this partition function by uh, choosing some line at some given height K here, and then considering the partition function on the lower lattice on the upper lattice when of course you will have some intersection at some value and then you have to sum over all possible intermediate value here on the horizontal line which is a distance k from from the basis okay so it is clear that we can write this partition function as a sum over j going from one to l one two three l of the partition function of going, which counts the path going from here to some given j here, which is given by by j plus. We cannot hear you anymore. No. You hear me? Yes. Yes. No, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the equal is given uh, is my fault for some reason. Well, I don't know what to do. Anyway, so you you divide you you. We are summing over the partition function for the lower part, which is given by the number of paths going from the origin to this value jk. And then, of course, you have to multiply by the lower part, higher part, which is of going from here to here. So this is just L minus j, this is just M minus k. And you have to sum over the position j, which goes here, okay? <clears throat> so, I am doing this, this calculation because, uh, uh, you know, in the tangent method, actually, we are essentially doing this calculation in a much more complicated setting. And so I will not do it in detail over there, but uh, the philosophy is already here. So it, as you will see, it's quite a trivial philosophy. So now we want to go into the scaling limit. The scaling limit means to send, to rescale all variable, we choose a, a, a large parameter which respect which will be in, we choose this to be l we send l to infinity 
and we write J equal psi L, K equal eta L, and M equal mu L, L is just L itself, and we sell, send L to infinity. Moreover, uh, we use uh, Stirling approximation. Stirling approximation, I recall you, we just uh, Is stealing approximation. If you have never done it, you should do. I mean, if you have never done it, you should verify that uh, a lot of factors uh, simplify. And when you consider, for instance, a binomial, this becomes just, this becomes simply. I am saying something bad. When you rescale, sorry. This is a little bit wrong. So if you rescale uh, just in this way, and uh, we consider, for instance, this situation, so uh, j plus k over j, this factorial, it is uh, easy to verify that you have some square root coming from the combination of this factor, which is actually not very important. And uh, what is important, because we will work with the saddle point uh, approximation, is exponential. And the exponential is of, always of this form. Maybe if you have uh, once do, done some elementary course in probability, you have seen this. Uh, you take the binomial and you see that the binomial will tend to some gauss and in some scaling limit. And this is exactly the calculation you do. Sorry, Philippe. In, in, this, uh, in this sum, uh, you have to sum over k also, no? No. So it's independent on k. Here, I fix some k, generic k. Then I will vary k, but this is another question. I fix some k, and then uh, I divide this part in the lower part till k, and I will have to sum over j. Uh, the left hand side does not depend on k. Sorry, I don't hear you. But... The left hand side of the equation does not depend on k. And you will see that the right hand side, ah, sorry. Uh, you will see that the right hand side actually, uh, sorry, you're right. Uh, I mean, it's simple, but of course, the left hand side does not depend on K. Yes, yes. Of course, the right hand side does not depend on K. The dependence of K will be, will in some sense cancel. I cancel that. Sorry? It cancels. Yes, it cancels. Okay. It's sorry, not obvious, if... but. Sorry? Uh, Filippo, can you just, uh, on the picture, on the figure, it's not entirely clear what J is, maybe. Sorry, yes. So this is K, and yes. J is the position, is the horizontal, uh, so this, the coordinate of the point where the path crosses, the lattice path crosses the line, horizontal line uh, at height K, will have coordinate JK. Yes. And then I have to sum over all j's. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, and on the right uh, blackboard, uh, it's hard to read what the definition of your function L of x. Yes, you're right. So L of x is just x, sorry, it does the x log x. Okay, this is always, uh, when you do this kind of uh, statistical physics or probability and scaling limit, you will obtain uh, 
you will always have a lot of, a lot of factorials, and this factorial will give you a, always this kind of function L. So it's, it's simpler. Uh, there is another small thing that should have stay. Here I am cheating a little bit because it's not clear if I am crossing the line K. I mean, in principle, I could cross the line K uh, arriving here and making it turn just exactly on the line at height K, or I could go straight. So this would be would give you a slightly different count, but in the scaling limit, uh, you are just uh, uh, adding one one step or not, so it's really not important. I mean, okay. at this stage, it's not important, and even it's irre irrelevant, and it will remain irrelevant even when we add some additional weight to this lattice path. Uh, you have a question? Is there a question? Okay, well, in, in the last... The question maybe it should be x. Uh, yes, you're right. So, uh, sorry, uh, it was remarked by some guy inside the lecture hall that. Uh, by Severio Buscini, actually, that uh, here I have x and y. Actually, I, have, I am using the scaling, so I should write uh, xi and eta. OK. OK, so the result is that uh, if you replace this inside here, you will have obtain some uh, you will obtain some, uh, and you also replace the sum as usual. We, you look at this sum as a Riemann sum, and so you replace it in the scaling limit with the corresponding integral. All this can be made completely rigorous. What you get is that your partition function is equal to some integral between zero and one in dx i, Um, of some prefactor which is not a very relevant, of some e to the l s, where s is an, an action, essentially an action, which depends on xi, eta, and mu. Xi, eta, and mu. Okay, which just uh, you have just to replace here what I have written properly and then uh, replace the sum with the integral, and what you obtain is this. And this action actually is simply given by Okay, so now you make the saddle point, you just work out the saddle point equation. The saddle point equation appears to be looks intricate, but it is not at all. So you have to make, you are looking at the saddle point for this integral over variable xi, so you have to derivate your action with respect to xi. In the saddle point equation appears to be you make the derivative and uh, the logarithm will give you some factor which we, and you put it to uh, <coughs> you will have the logarithm of something which is zero then you exponentiate what you get is the saddle point is c plus eta one minus c xi xi uno minus xi q the saddle point equation is of the form log of this equals zero. But then you exponentiate, you obtain this, and this looks complicated, but actually you see that 
the solution is just this one. Okay, so what is mu? Mu is defined in this way. It is just uh, the slope, the slope of the straight line, which goes from, from the point zero to the point LM. And what we see is that the saddle point solution tells us that if we cut this line at some height here, which is uh, uh, an height eta, then this line will cross the horizontal line, the, 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 the line, the straight line over which all paths accumulate will, will cross the horizontal line exactly at position psi equal eta over mu. That is to say, wherever you cross here, you, you will see that you actually you are actually very fine that this is a straight line. Okay. So this calculation is a uh, it's a truism. I mean, it's uh, really nothing. But uh, this, but uh, we shall do this calculation is, uh, without working all the details in a slightly different context, and we will see what will emerge. Okay. Th uh, so thank you. This is a very nice uh, exercise. So maybe we have questions about this. Um, so are there questions about this calculation? Um, I got a question on the top right. Board. Sure. Um, on, so you have the square root on of like on L one minus uh, zeta or something like that, right? Is it belong to the, does it belong to the action? I cannot see uh, uh, where he, uh, Professor uh, Colombo put it. So Filippo, did you hear the question? Only partially, if you repeat it, please, because audio is not so good. Because okay, so the question is, what did you do with the square root? Uh, does it appear? Does it? Uh, did you put it in your action or? Uh... Uh, well, the, so, you know. Uh, so the, the where is the action? It's over there. Yes. In this action, you see, you have L in front of it. L is what we are sending to infinity. So here you have some square root, and even if you exponentiate it, it will be of order. Uh, constant. Even if here you have some L, when you exponentiate it, it will be log L. So it will be always subleading. So it's not important. In the leading order, what you have is this. And this, so what uh, maybe I can add something. This partition function written in these ways says that the partition function can be written as an integral over all these position psi uh, uh, of all the line which goes in this way, okay? You have to, to sum like a path integral over all possible paths, but the point is the saddle point calculation, this says you that the, the paths that are important concentrate and the probability distribution of having your path crossing the horizontal line here is essentially zero. So the probability distribution is picked let us put here the probability distribution of crossing the horizontal line. You see it is picked in this way. Around this point. Oh, do you see this? It's written here. You have e to the L, you can verify to some action. L is very large. This action uh, appears to be convex. You can compute the first derivative and uh, this gives you the saddle point equation. The second derivative will be negative. And so what you have in the larger limit is essentially a Gaussian with variance one over square root of L. And uh, so it is a very, very picked around this value. This is standard saddle point evaluation. Okay, this is the content of this equation. That the, you have to sum uh, over all possible psi and the probability distribution is given by this. This is subleading effect. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, are there other questions? Um, I'm, yeah, um, as, you, uh, as he's mentioning, um, so if you take uh, L to infinity, uh, will the distribution become like some sort of direct delta function or? Uh, yeah, I think that's what uh, Filippo just said. So Filippo, the question is, uh, 
that, as L goes to infinity, does the distribution become a Dirac delta function? Yes, yes. If, uh, as, well, I can write it in detail, it's just one line. You have E to the, the distribution is some, at leading order is this. You can write it as E to the L, S of eta saddle point. Then you have, uh, by definition, the saddle point is such that the first derivative is zero. We are expanding around the saddle point. Okay, so I, I should write it here. Sorry, uh, actually, it's xi saddle point. This is the probability dis distribution. This is multiplied by L and exponentiated, okay? And so this is zero because we are on the saddle point. So this will be, give you some normalization and this will give you a, a Gaussian, but you have an L here in front. So it will be a Gaussian with a variance of order one over square root of L. So a variance which goes to zero in the large L limit. Actually, this is what is called a delta family. Okay, this is standard saddle point method. Hope I have answered the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, maybe we can continue. Yeah. Yes, let us do five more minutes or 10 more minutes. Okay, so this simple calculation is just to show that you can, uh, when you have some lattice paths, they concentrate on the straight line and that uh, actually, well, it's, it's obvious when you have seen it. You have to think about it the first time, but then it's, uh, it's tautological. Okay. So now we have, uh, we have uh, more or less developed the two, two small technical ingredients. So we can tackle the tangent method uh, thinking more on, on the philosophy, okay? So I recall you, that we have all our line which goes in this way, here they go in this way, and sometimes they go in. And this is essentially in the scaling limit, this will become the Arctic curve, okay? So it is clear that if you concentrate on this line, on the line which starts from the top left corner of the lattice, this will actually go straight in the first part. These are the contact points of the Arctic curve. It will go straight until, uh, uh, until it reaches the contact point. Then it will start to, to, to go randomly, but it will be the ex extremal line of, the, Arctic, of uh, the disordered region. And so it will really follow uh, the boundary of the, of the disordered region. And in the scaling limit, actually, it will concentrate on the Arctic curve, okay? The problem is that uh, w which calculation can we do with this observation? By itself, nothing. But let us suppose we extend our lattice. I should make made probably a cleaner. We extend our lattice. Uh, or domain, or domain on the square lattice, we extend our domain uh, till minus infinity in the bottom direction. So here we have n lines. This is one, two n lines. Here we have only 
n minus one lines. This is our choice. So we know that now that one, the, this extremal line will not get out from the left here because only n minus one of them, the first n minus one will go this way. The last one will, will uh, make his path maybe along the Arctic curve here. And uh, at some times, where will it go? It will have to go out where we impose it. We impose it to go out at some distance here, which we call minus L. We, we impose a boundary, a very peculiar boundary condition of having N line entering from the top, N minus one getting out from the left uh, in a consecutive one, a way here. And very far in the bottom, we put the last N line to get out at this position. So our lattice path will go in this way. This is quite clear. Of course, in, in principle, it can go in all possible allowed ways, but uh, we expect it to concentrate here. And uh, moreover, it will follow the Arctic curve as long as it can. But at some stage, it will, it will be, I mean, the free energy, there will be a computation for, for, between the free energy required to, to detach this path from the Arctic curve and the free energy required to make all these paths from here to here. And uh, what we expect, of course, is that this in the scaling limit will be a straight line. And also what we expect here is that this will leave the Arctic curve in a tangent way. So these are two assumptions. This assumption, uh, well, uh, in principle, you should prove them, but uh, we are not able to prove them. They are quite sensible, but uh, so one is quite easy to prove actually. The fact that this will be a straight line and will not do in the scaling limit and will not do something like this. This essentially has been proven 10 minutes ago in a slightly simpler context. Okay, then the other thing to, to one should prove is actually that exactly that this path will, will leave the Arctic curve in a tangent way. So if we are considered uh, free fermion uh, dimers, I mean, uh, domino tilings, you can map the model on a model of path and the paths are expected not to interact. So you, you of course, the path, you know, what is the problem is that if there is some interaction, you could imagine that there is some glue, which some energy, which uh, want to stick the last path to the Arctic curve, to the disordered region as much as possible. And then it will leave it only when the tension of this path will be get, uh, get, bigger, get bigger than the glue, that the interacting energy between this path and the other ones, okay? So if you have no interaction, it is quite sensible to to believe that this is tangent. Also why you have to think. So if the interaction is repulsive, no problem, of course. You will never have, for a, have something which goes in this way for entropic region, because as soon as you are here, you are already macroscopically far from, from the, all the other paths and you are alone, so you don't mind. So what actually should be proven is that this goes tangentially. Uh, there is an argument to, to, to show this, the argument is the following. Imagine that you have so the tangent method is heuristic, okay, but it works. So uh, of course the rigor is not there at the moment. So uh, let us suppose we have some uh, piece of Arctic curve here. I am really going. <laughs> Sorry, do is that do we have a question or is that a problem of, with the okay? So I'm I'm gonna mute you because there's some noise. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Some participants had their had their microphone on. So okay, let us suppose this is a n minus one path. This one, and here we have the n path. Okay. But we are looking in, in this region near uh, the tangency point. At the, so let us suppose there is some glue. We are looking, for instance, here. Some glue means to replace the relation. I mean, 
so you suppose we have some interaction. This uh, we need to compare what is the energy, for instance, of this with respect to this. You see, here we have detached. Detached, these two here, these two paths are closed. Here, these two paths are, have been separated. And so we have to compare the two energy. If this one is favorable, we cannot exclude that the tangent assumption, the tangency assumption is wrong. But if this is energetically favorable, it is clear that the tangent assumption is valid. And it is easy to see that here we are replacing 1A, so we are, everything remains the same, but we are essentially replacing uh, 2A with 2C. So and, uh, the, from the point of view of the Boltzmann weight of the full configuration, we are replacing A with C. And so, sorry, I am correct. Yes, uh, I am. Uh, maybe. Yes. Okay, so this will be. Uh, I don't remember my argument, sorry. <laughs> anyway, the point is the following, is that if you make the careful the calculation uh, in this way, you see that the condition for the tangency assumption to be valid is this one. We are here in, in, uh, in, in this quadrant, and so here we have a, a C. Here, the majority of weights of vertex are of the second kind over there, of type A of the second kind. And so <clears throat> when you here you, you detach, you replace some A with some C, but in the end, the, the conclusion is this one. So you have to, to consider if A is lower than C, for sure the transitive assumption is valid. Just a moment, let us look at the phase diagram. A is lo lower than C means that for sure, in this region, uh, to the left of this vertical line, the tangent assumption is, uh, no, the contrary. We cannot uh, be sure that to the right of this tangent line, this assumption is valid, okay? You can also reverse A with B because you could do this kind of consideration instead of here, you could do it, for instance, here. You could, uh, uh, you could play with, uh, with A and B. And the result is that actually, what is uh, where the tangent assumption is for sure valid is it in this region, when this is a combinatorial point, okay? Delta equal one half. Uh, outside, uh, it looks like everything works well, uh, but uh, we are not sure. Well, we believe that the tangent assumption is valid, but we cannot say much about this. Um, yes. So maybe we can ask some questions now. Uh, so let me start with one. So um, okay. So I, it's 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 very clear from what you've explained that um, uh, that if you can compute uh, this prob the the probability so the the probability uh, if you can compute this partition function yes um, then then you will get the answer from this uh, argument. But yes. uh, but uh, on the other hand, it looks like a very complicated geometry. So what? So well, we shall see that it is very easy uh, in the next hour. Maybe you now we, it's time for to do for some break. Apart from some question, of course. Ah, so you you're actually going to I, I tell us how? It's quite easy. Okay. Okay. I see. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there questions? So I think there. Uh, Jacopo has a comment in the chat. Maybe uh, Jacopo, do you want to? Ah, well, I was just uh, putting the sum on Mathematica. Uh, 
and uh, apparently depends on uh, K. So, so that's why sorry, I was so puzzled by this. Uh, okay, so you're talking again about the the, the previous argument with the yes. with the sim simple random walk. Uh, yeah, so I understand the argument that if you fix K, then uh, you are dominated by essentially uh, the paths which uh, align. So essentially, it's independent on K. But, uh, but formally, the equation it doesn't look correct because uh, on I the left hand side there was something independent on K, and on the right hand side there was something dependent on K. You're right. You're right, and I should answer to this. I mean, in the meantime, I have uh, thought about it. So, uh, formal. I mean, uh, the answer depends on k. If you go to the integral, the answer depends on this eta. Okay, depend on this eta. But then, when you, uh, it depends on this eta. But if you compute the derivative of the quantity to, with respect to eta, this will be zero because you have various terms which cancel. Even at, uh, uh, sorry, I have a problem. No, I have no problem. Yes, I am sure of this. Can you compute the derivative with respect to k? Well, maybe we can, uh, it will take you a few minutes, so we can come back to this later on. So someone uh, someone answered in the chat. So uh, Jacob Robertson uh, said that uh, this is but, a well-known combinatorial identity. But it is not the same formula because you see that here it appears only k. So you sum. Whereas there there was a, a variable on which there was not uh, fixed by the sum. So it's not the same that is in that that, that is uh, written here in the Wikipedia. Sorry, I will, uh, I, will, I will use the break to think a bit about it, or otherwise I will think about it for the question of this afternoon. This is, uh, uh, but I am, I mean, there are, uh, of course, uh, yes, there is this uh, Chu van der Monde identity, but I should check it because now I don't remember it by heart, it should be compared. But uh, it's not the same as in Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, it's a simpler version because it is just a, a sum over one index. While in your formula there was an, another index which was not summed over. No, but it's it's important that it's not summed over, right? Just from the picture, uh, because you want to fix k, and then you want for a given k, you want to keep track of all the paths that are passing through position j. So. Yeah, but yes, I I understand the the the, um, the argument, but somehow it seems that uh, it is not the partition function, the full partition function, just some mm -hmm. uh, some uh, subset of paths which uh, have some height fixed, and then you 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 actually discover that among all of them, uh, only the one which uh, are aligned matters. So in fact, is it does not depend on k. But it doesn't look that the equality is correct. Well, okay. Anyway, this maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we should keep this for the for this uh, for the session this afternoon, since uh, yes. this is rather uh, uh, about it a few minutes, uh, sometime maybe ten minutes. Yeah, this is le le so it's a, it's a te technical point that uh, yes, it's going to take some time to clean it up, but uh, it's perhaps not so not so deep. Um, uh, are there other questions about other aspects of the of the lecture? Well, so are you going to make uh, explicit the? Um... I will make explicit calculation of this partition function. Okay, well, and, and I will uh, express this partition function in terms of uh, the function. I have cancelled something. No, in terms of this function h n of z, h n of r. Okay. okay. So then the problem is is reduced to, to compute this boundary correlation function, which is uh, can be difficult, but uh, for sure simpler than bulk correlation function. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so, are there other questions before the break?
Uh, okay, it doesn't look like there are other questions, so let's take a 10 minute break. Um, and so we re recombine at 11 10. 11 10, yes, seven minute break. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Could we start again? Uh, I, I think so, yeah, please. Um, Jacopo, is it okay? Sure, sure, please. Should I start? Yes. Okay, so I will think about this. Uh, yes, it's not exactly Schumann-Delmont formula, also it's quite similar. Um, it could be that I made some mistake with k and k minus one, and that's why, so, because I didn't mind about k and k uh, about minus one or plus one, because I am interested in the scaling limit. So it could be that this difference, this dependence on k could be could be due to some small mistake of mine, or I don't know. I will think about it. I will tell you something this afternoon. Okay. So, coming back to this picture, so the idea, I have told you the idea, if we are able to compute this partition function, this should be tangent to this Arctic curve. Then we will have, we can vary this L, we can consider, so what is this? This is essentially, it is uh, related to the quantity we have defined better. So the, uh, the position of crossing this horizontal line uh, in correspondence of the origin uh, is a consequence of uh, the pulling between two different forces. One is the one of uh, due to the entropy of this lattice pass here, which goes to minus L. And the other one is, is due to the function HN of Z or R of Z that you are of the R, which count uh, the tension you have to pull away uh, this line from its natural uh, path. Okay. Uh, what is uh, that is another assumption? The other assumption is that if you consider this model, you know you expect that the scaling limit is at the curve. You assume it. Actually, again, this is not even proven for the six vertex model. You assume that you have some Arctic curve. And uh, here you assume that uh, when you pull away one pass, the Arctic curve remains the same. And this is very reasonable because this reasonable because this depends is made of n minus one pass with n very large. And so if you take away or peel away only one pass, it will not uh, alter this. And uh, the full Arctic curve is just given by the old Arctic curve plus this straight line, which we assume to be tangent. So the assumption are clearly stated. Then if you have a family of straight line, which goes here, you can go to the rescaling, you can go to the rescaling variables. So let us introduce some notation. The rescaled variable u is just L over N. We are interested in the limit where N will be large, L will be large, and U will be some parameter which vary from here to here with minus L going to minus infinity. So U is a continuous, is a real parameter on the positive real line. Okay. And uh, so now we shall call this quantity Xi, which of course is a, we, which is coordinate. Let us call this coordinate Xi, which of course will be Xi of U in principle, because the lower the pool here, of course, Xi will get bigger. But if we call this rescaled value of Xi equal R of an N, where R is a position here. And uh, so Xi equal R over N. Here we, we are using not rescaled variables, so I cancel this. Okay, so now we can write what is the equation of this straight line? The equation of this straight line is clearly, or do you write the equation of a straight line? You write uh, <laughs> okay. A generic point y will have uh, to respect uh, the ratio between. Uh, uh, so e, I have introduced a coordinate here. 
So let us see them then. Here you have some coordinate axis. Okay. So in the scaling limit, the equation of this straight line will be given by this condition, or if you prefer, by this condition. Okay, so what is this? This is a family of straight lines parameterized by u, which is essentially the rescaled vertical variable. And uh, xi of u is just this horizontal distance. And uh, of course, we have to determine what is the dependence of xi from u. And this will be determined by computing this partition function, which will be given just as we did in the previous exercise by a sum over all position here, where this line can get out. So we have to do a sum over this variable. Then we will make some saddle point equation and this will determine our psi of u, okay? Okay, so now let us compute this partition function so we can uh, the lenses. So, uh, again, just as we did before, this partition function will be uh, splitted into a, an upper partition, fun uh, I mean, the domain will be split in an upper domain, which will be of size n vertical lines and only n minus one horizontal lines. And uh, we have to compute this partition function. Then the other partition function we have to compute is that. So, um, sorry. The first partition function is the one where we have n line entering from the top, n minus one getting out from the left, and one getting out from the bottom at position r. The second uh, partition function is that of a single random lattice pass, which goes on this uh, domain, okay? So as for the first part, if you recall what I have told you at the beginning of this lecture, it is clear that this partition function in this way with n and n minus one, I recall you that we have introduced that the hn of r was the probability of observing the n by n lattice, so of observing the the sole C vertex in the last line to be at position R. It is, and I have told you that this uh, probability is given by the partition function depicted here, divided by the usual partition function. So here, what is the difference? The difference is only in this last line. So we can find the partition function, this partition function can be written as we have to divide by the Boltzmann weight associated to this plus line, okay? And which is the Boltzmann weight? Here we have a R vertex of the fourth type, that is a B to the R. Then we have one vertex C. And then we have n minus r vertex of the second type. So you have a to the n minus r. So the partition function of this n times n minus one lattice with a single pass going away from the bottom at position r is just given by this expression, where this hn of r 
of course, has to be computed. Okay, and uh, sometimes you are able, sometimes not. But uh, what I want to say, well, no, I will say this later. So this is the top part. Then we have to to count the, the bottom, to evaluate the bottom part. The bottom part is again a directed lattice path, but now we have some small complication due to the fact that we are not giving weight one to each path, but we are giving a weight related to the vertex ABC. Here, the background is all made of vertex of the second type, A, and then you have this path, which will create you some, some vertex of type B and C according to what, to if, to whether you have a, a turn or just a straight when you, when you go, when you build this random path. <laughs> okay, so let us consider a, a path going from the origin to a, a directed lattice path going from the origin to the point X, Y on the lattice. So the number, the partition function, or if you prefer the number of lattice path, I have just told you before is simply this. But let us suppose we give a weight omega. Omega each time we have one turn. So here I have three turns, five turns. So we are going sorry, to position five turns. So I want to weight this such path with a weight omega to the five. I give a weight omega to each turn. This is left as an exercise, uh, not very easy, but not terribly difficult. It can be proven. So this is the definition. We are summing over all path gamma, lattice path from zero, zero, from the origin to x, y, and we give a weight omega to the number of, let us consider just uh, this kind, the vertex of type six. Because as, as you remember, anytime you have a vertex of type six, sooner or later you will have a vertex of type five. So when you count the type six vertex, you will also count the type five. And uh, you can compute, this is to be proven, that uh, this expression, this uh, quantity can be written in, as follow. Here's a, uh, so this is left as an exercise, but there is a small caveat. Since you are giving away to the turn, you should decide if your first and last step have it as a turn or not. This, you know, depends if you are considering a path on your lattice, starting from the origin, and you want to give a weight omega to each turn of this type, here you should know what, what was the previous path, the path uh, minus one. If it was in this way or in this way, this has to be fixed because it will alter uh, this number by one. It's not really important because we're interested in the scaling limit, but uh, but uh, you have to be careful with that. Okay. And uh, of course, then you, you can, this is for a general equate omega, you want to relate this. Omega, of course, is related to the C and the Bs. So you, you give a weight, when you have nothing here, you will have a C of a C uh, I mean, a, a, an enormous quantity of vertex of type A, but then th this path will create uh, X plus Y vertex of type B and C. So we can normalize uh, by dividing with respect to A. And uh, the result is that uh, if you are considering the six vertex lattice, your single path will be, will have this expression. This again can be derived with, uh, from the previous formula very easily. Okay. 
Okay? So now we have just uh, to multiply. So uh, this was for uh, generic X and Y, but you, we have to translate this in the language of this lattice. So our partition function is given by, for the top part by this, and for the bottom part, simply by Formula is a bit bulky, but So we have two binomials, this is a fraction. We have to make, so this is, as I told you, the partition function for the bottom part of the domain. The, this is for the top part of the domain. They both depend, uh, sorry, they should depend on some, uh, I, I have a small mistake here. Okay, I call it K, so this is, let us replace R by K. So this is k, k, very good. And now we have to sum over all possible k. The k live on this axis. So they goes from zero, from one to n essentially. Okay, so this is a total partition function. We are interested in the scaling limit. You know that we have a double sum. This is the sum of this path and this is the sum which come from the computation of the lattice path in the bottom part. And we have to make a double saddle point. So we have to rescale all variables. So I show, uh, you can see also that you can normalize this. So in such a way that you are, if you want to divide by the usual partition function and by of the top and bottom part when you have no pass here because your pass goes here, the result will be the partition, the, diff, uh, the ratio of the partition function or in terms of the free energy, the free energy, the difference of free energy for having your pass getting out at position L with respect to the normal standard situation. So, so uh, just a small question. So, uh, uh, sorry, what is X in the formula? You have a factor A to the X over L uh, the first, so very first factor in the sum. A to NL. A to NL is just... Uh, ah, it's an N, sorry, 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 sorry. I have normalized it. I have, yeah. I have put away all the A factors, the A vertex which are present here. Mm -hmm. A by L rectangle. N by L rectangle. Yeah. So then all the B and the C are actually divided by A. Sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Then we can put even A equal one, as you know, it's not important. This is a, actually two slightly simplified formula. So. This has a lot of factors, but actually the important part is just this. So we are interested in the scaling limit, so k minus one can be replaced by k, we don't mind. And we have this double sum, and we have this expression in terms of the Boltzmann way of the six vertex model. So we have two variables, two, two, two indices, over which we sum, which are L and K. And this is expression. So we go into to the scaling limit. To go to the scaling limit is very standard procedure. You have to introduce rescaled variables. I will just introduce the notation, but not doing all the calculation, which are very, very standard. So we can introduce, for instance, L over N, we, will, we have already decided to call it U, and it will be the parameter which parameterize our family of straight lines. 
then we will have k over n, where k is this index which some which we sum here to to make this kind of sum over all possible point of passage point for the for this single path. K over n, we will call it xi, and of course it belongs to the interval, unit real interval. Then we can write L over N, where L is this index we, use, we are summing up, as some eta. This is uh, less physical as an index in some sense, because uh, it is related to, to how we wrote the partition function related to, to this lattice path. But uh, of course, eta is has to be smaller than both psi and u. It is smaller than the minimum between psi and u. Sorry, Filippo, could you just uh, tell us on the on the pic on the picture of the partition function? Could you just uh, remind us? Yes. Uh, because I think r has been changed into k, and uh, I don't know what little l is uh, anymore on the figure. So little l is uh, he does not appear here because little l was just uh, as the index appearing in the expression which was computing the weighted lattice path in the bottom part of the domain. Okay, you remember if you don't give a weight, the number of lattice paths was just x plus y over x. But if you give a weight omega each time you have a turn, then your partition function be, be, was becoming. Uh, uh, more complicated as a sum over L, omega to the L, X over L and Y, sorry, what, what was it? Just to be sure. It was, uh, oh, I have lost my sheet of paper. Ah, here is it. Um, yeah. So this is what I call it P omega of X and Y. That is a number of paths from origin to the point X, Y with a weight omega assigned to each turn, which uh, vertex of type five. Okay, so you have this sum L, L not really related to the geometry of the domain. Of course, L has to be smaller than X and Y. This sum is in principle till infinity, but this becomes zero as soon as L is larger than X or Y. So this tells you that eta has to be smaller than X, Xi and U. But this is not important. Well, it is important when you look for the saddle point position, you should have a saddle point solution. You should respect this constraint. But apart from this, okay. So once you have this, you define a free energy, which of course will depend on you, on, on this variable, on this parameter, and uh, which tell how much your free energy varies uh, when you pull this last path down. It is obviously defined Our uh, reference variable going to infinity is n. So we normalize everything with respect to n, which is natural. And so this is the free energy associated to this partition function. And uh, we define this free energy in this way. We can study it in the saddle point, in the saddle point approximation. So what could I delete? I will delete this. As usual, as usual, when you go to the scaling limit, this sum can be interpreted as Riemann sum. So uh, it becomes some integral in the limit, and uh, actually it becomes an integral in over the variable 
L and K becomes E times psi, so it becomes an integral in D eta D psi, where uh, D eta and D psi should stay in the range I have indicated over there. And then you expand all the binomials and uh, you take the exponential contribution. What you get is essentially E to some S of psi eta and U, where is essentially the limit what I have written here, the limit of the logarithm of this quantity, which I write of this quantity, and which I can write as some function. In terms of the function L, I recall L is just can rewrite it as some function L of psi minus L of eta minus L of psi minus eta. It is very easy to make this computation. It's left as an exercise. Uh, I think that by now I can cancel this. Well, maybe not, but yes, u log db plus sorry, it's a bit boring, but. Uh, how does this formula come from? It is very easy, really. So here I will rewrite for completeness uh, that we have this. So as a way, it's an okay. I recall you that it is this one point boundary correlation function. And uh, what we have here, when you have your binomial, you exponentiate heat, and remember K will become Xi, L will become eta. So this will be, give you L of I minus L of eta minus L, because in the denominator of the binomial, you have L factorial and uh, K minus L factorial. So this will be L of I minus L of eta minus L of I minus eta. Do the same for this plus L of, I recall you that you rescale variable large L to U. So plus L of U minus L of eta minus L of U minus eta. Then you have this term, the last three term. This one you don't know still its explicit form. So I have to leave it indicated okay, in this way. So this is your action. And then you do a subtle point evaluation of your integral. And so you have to make derivative of this with respect to psi and eta. I will not do this. And, uh, but you can imagine that when you derive with respect to psi and eta, for instance, here, you derive with respect to psi this quantity, and what will appear is this piece. You see? For instance. And uh, when you derive to eta, you will have a combination of weight B and C and some small function. The result of all this, the result, so you, you find the solution, psi saddle point and eta saddle point, which uh, solve this saddle point equation, which are simply, you write the saddle point equation. 
you solve them and you will obtain some psi star and some eta star. And uh, actually this will be depend on u because you have your variable u inside here, which is uh, L over n. For instance, here you will have some u appearing, right? And so then you invert the dependence uh, of eta with respect to u and you plug in here. You are finding, you are able from these two equations to extract psi of u and u. The computation are bulky, but you can find them on, on the paper. So it's not really important. The important thing is that the solution of this saddle point equation, plug in the E2 here, give you some explicit expression for the family of straight line. And this is what I will write now. It is a relatively simple expression. So when you plug in the saddle point solution here, what you get is simply we have traded, it is convenient to trade the parameter u to the parameter z. Anyway, they are related because, uh, because uh, U was appearing here and uh, said here, and you can relate them because that saddle point equation is still valid. Um, Or maybe I should write it better. Okay. Sorry. Of course, this is the equation of family of straight line when you put this equal to zero. They depend on some parameter z. Instead of u, we have traded u for a different parameter z, which goes from. So this is a family of straight line. If you are able to compute this, everything is fixed. A, B, C, you know, and uh, it is family of straight line in the plane x, y, large x, x, y. And uh, if you draw this family of straight line, for various values of z due to our construction, the envelope of this family of, of curves will be a smooth curve. And due to our construction, we assume that this is arctic curve. Okay, so it is, this is the result. So when you have a family of straight line given in this way, in the form f, x, y, which are variables and z is a parameter equals zero. Where f, x, y, z is essentially, is exactly what I have written here, equal to zero. Or do you, this is your family of straight line, so it's linear in x and y. You can, uh, you can uh, write the osculating curve, the envelope, simply by writing the system between the function x, the function f, and its derivative. So this is a system in two variables x and y, linear, and it's uh, trivial to solve it. The expression that comes out can be quite bulky, but you see that at this stage, we have not said anything about it. So if you know this, you can build the Arctic curve. So what is interesting in this? That in principle, you imagine that to build the Arctic curve, it is a boundary between disordered and order region. It's very far from the boundary. You would suppose it is necessary to have some, some uh, bulk correlation function, some correlation function related to some point inside the lattice. But uh, it, this relation shows you that if you know only the 
boundary correlation function, due to the construction, you are able to, to extract uh, non-trivial information about what happens into the bulk. Okay, so I think this could, uh, I will conclude with two examples. So how to compute HN? Well, this is not terribly difficult in the domain wall six vertex model. Of course, it's always much simpler to compute a boundary correlation function with respect to a bulk correlation function, but it can be non-trivial. Not so many cases are known, but some are known, and there are a lot of examples around. For instance, Philippe Di Francesco has computed the Arctic curve using this method, computed the Arctic curve for the 20 vertex model. Uh, and uh, then other people have uh, uh, considered a different combinatorial object, objects and uh, Again, uh, they can apply this trick to compute the corresponding Arctic curve. So this method looks quite efficient. Of course, one could ask, there are many assumptions, there are two assumptions, at least two strong assumptions in this method, but uh, they are reasonable. I must say also that at least for the case delta equal one half, mathematicians have proven rigorously the method only in one case. I mean, for the six vertex model on the domain wall boundary con with domain wall boundary condition and at delta equal one half, this method can be worked out in complete rigor. And uh, this is a paper by Amos Agarwal of uh, very recent 2020. And another thing I have to say also is that actually originally the Arctic curve was not obtained in this way. Um, it was obtained in a completely independent way, which was which was, uh, well, I can cancel here. So what we did was to build some correlation function, which is uh, um, non-local, but at the same time, in, due to some technicalities in the quantum, in, in the quantum inverse scattering method and algebraic beta ansatz, it appears to be simpler to compute with respect to a one or two point correlation function. It is the probability of having some region in the top left corner, some rectangular region, which is completely frozen. You, you can imagine, and actually it can be shown uh, quite uh, convincingly, that uh, uh, this probability will be if the coordinate of this point R S, let us say that this is the coordinate. The coordinate of this point R and S are such that the square is small, then you will you expect to have probability one of having this uh, square completely, rectangle completely frozen. <laughs> and as soon as the rectangle will cross the curve, this will drop to zero. So what you expect is that this correlation function is one outside the Arctic curve and zero inside. So we were able to build a multiple integral representation for this. It was a multiple integral with S, S integration, S fold integral, okay? It was a contour integral actually in the complex plane. Well, when you are in the scaling limit, this S tend to infinity and then you add some integrand, which was depending on R and S and the size of the model, which is N. But uh, the technology you can use in this case is essentially technology from random matrix models. You know, when you have a, a lot of, uh, you are interested in the limit of a multiple integral in a limit in which the number of integration goes to infinity. And uh, this is quite standard situation in random matrix model. So using tricks from them, we were able to, to determine this step wise behavior from outside and inside the Arctic curve as a function of Rs, which when are rescaled in terms of recalled variable as a function of X and Y, which are exactly this X and Y. And with this completely different method, what was obtained was exactly the same Arctic curve. So this gives strong support to the tangent method. Uh, the Tanzas method has a big advantage. Uh, the method which was developed originally here can be used only for the six vertex model with domain wall boundary condition. The Tanzas method can be used to any situation where you have path. And uh, moreover, usually when you have paths, you consider them non-interacting. But uh, uh, what is nice here is that the picture holds also for interacting paths because the picture 
You know, as was explained in the lecture by Balosh yesterday and two days ago, uh, when you have uh, only one particle in your uh, beta ansatz solution for the exact same chain, or if you have two particles but they are more than two sides apart, it, they just behave as three particles. And this is the same. Here you have the path, which in the Hamiltonian limit of executive chain will be actually a particle. It is far from every other particle. So it, it's like if it were free. So here you can really use method of uh, equivalent to the free Fabian one. The only problem is with interaction, but uh, so this is what is related to the problem of the assumption of tangency. But uh, apart from this, if you accept this assumption, then this explains why you are able to extract something in this way. Okay, so I think it, ah, I would just want to quote two, two, two examples. Well, uh, you can, uh, I will give you two simple examples in which the function hn, hn is known actually for the whole, for the vertex model, the function hn, or more precisely the function r of z, is now exactly, at least in the scaling limit. And uh, it's now at some complicated determinant representation where you are not in the scaling limit. But in the scaling limit, expression somewhat simplifies. In particular, there are two situations where the expression is very simple. One is delta equals zero, free fermion, that is the domino timing of Atzec diamond. in which H n of R is simply a binomial. So H n of Z is easily seen to be one plus Z over N minus one. And uh, if you plug this inside this and you solve this system of equation, you indeed obtain the usual Arctic circle of domino tinings. Then instead, if you consider delta equal one half, Hn is slightly more complicated, but it is, this is a combinatorial point. And so you can, actually, this Hn error was computed long ago, ago by a mathematician, by Zalberger in the 90s, before physicists even know about the existence of, of the function Hn of R. And uh, it is just a, a combination of binomial. And it is an, a useful exercise to to work this out. This means, sorry, in this case, just for completeness, this is the last formula. This is just an hypergeometric series of uh, simple kind. So you can, uh, you have this expression. So in principle, you can compute, you can compute this or uh, this is R of Z and then you plug in inside here and you will obtain the Arctic curve for the delta equal one alpha case. Okay, so I think I have commented enough and uh, I will finish here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip Boom. Uh, so, are there uh, questions? Okay, so uh, I can start with one maybe. Uh, so I, I actually I did not understand uh, what, I did not understand the role of the parameter eta um, Actually, uh, eta is here an auxiliary variable. You know, uh, when you, you, again, eta is what is L here. So uh, I am correct. Yes, sure, but uh, so you had to... L, L is just, then when you write, uh, you want to compute this partition function, you have this, uh, this uh, partition function, it's not very simple. But uh, the partition function is not, uh, 
but this L does not appear in, the, in your picture. But when you do the saddle point, you have also to, co to, to, to take into account this, uh, this uh, sad, uh, I mean, the saddle point solution for the second variable. And it, it makes you the variable U and Z. So here I had variable U, but in the end, I expressed everything in Z. This is done essentially because this parameter L mix the variable u which was associated to large l and the variable z which was associated here uh yes but this is because you introduced some weight to the to the terms right this what you were calling omega yes uh so what why did you do that because uh, you know when i because um if I don't introduce weight, I can only compute the situation where A, B, C equal one. But I am interested in the situation where A, B, C are generic. So omega is essentially C squared. You know? Uh, ah, okay, I see. It's just to introduce the correct weight in the in the what you were calling this uh, second uh, partition yes. function. Yes, I see. In the bottom domain, mm -hmm. I have this path. On a, a standard lattice path, I would put just weight one to every step and no problem. But now I want to put a weight C square to each turn, a weight B to each, sorry, a weight C to each turn, a weight B to each, to each stride step. Yes, uh, I, I see, yes, okay. So Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? So there is a question here in the lecture hall. Yeah, so last time you showed some Arctic curves with the cusps. Does the this method work? Or, or yes. Also that because the, the tangent like enters the ah. enters the enters yes. The well, um, you mean this case? Yes. Yes. Yeah, you can apply tangent method here, here, everywhere. But actually, how can you apply tangent method here? You yes, can't. Yes. Okay, you. You can't. But you can but when we did this, we applied this to a free fermion case. In principle, you you could obtain this with Kenyon Okunkov method, but in practice, you cannot because it's too complicated. Uh, Kenyon Okunkov method is more or less under control on triangular lattice, on a comp lattice graph, uh, but. But uh, on the square lattice, it becomes already, uh, very soon very, very hard uh, for some technical reason. So what we did here was for the free fermion. For the free fermion, we know from Kenyon Okunkov that it is an algebraic curve. So if you know this, then you know everything. OK? OK, thanks. Just by analytic continuation. Well, well uh, no, I, we, I, I have summarized, I have commented and summarized it. So, well, open problems. Open problem, everything which goes beyond the Arctic curve uh, is uh, open in this context. So, essentially, there is a lot of work to do. Uh, the Arctic curve is more or less under control, but you have, for each model, you have any way to compute the equivalent of this function H, the boundary correlation function. It is May more or less doable in many cases, but uh, well, sometimes you have to do it. I mean, it's not always uh, on the market. What I like in this method, I, of course, it is a kind of handmade, very, very practical, very elementary method, but at the same time, it is quite powerful. So it's, it's nice, in my opinion. It's a little bit uh, kind of a baker method, you know, where you have some tricks. Uh, it's not even very rigorous and it's very elementary, but it works. So. Uh, what about Tracy Widom? We don't know. We don't know because uh, this Arctic curve is uh, only, is work, sorry, this tangent method works in the scaling limit. And you're interested in the first bleeding correction, okay? So uh, what we know about Tracy Widom is what was done numerically by Sprauer for Spohn is still unpublished. And so it seems that you have Tracy Widom in the Arctic curve of the circular fixed model. So this is a... Uh, an additional and quite strong uh, argument, I mean, uh, bricks in this universality of the Tracy-Widom distribution. 
Well, maybe we can stop here. Anyway, there is this afternoon session for questions. So, is there no uh, other question? Well, okay. Uh, are there any other urgent questions? Um, doesn't seem so. Okay, so let us all thank. I suggest we all uh, open our microphones and we clap for Filippo. So uh, thank you very much, Filippo, for these very nice lectures. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you all, and see you, you, you this afternoon. Yep. Okay.